Train the muscles, not the joints. So welcome back to Natural Land Bodybuilding. And today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some things I wished, some things I wish, some things I wish I knew when I first started bodybuilding. You got some pretty good peaks and you just keep working on that. Work on your strengths, man. Work on your strengths. Don't try to be like anybody else. Just be yourself. You got a lot of good peaks going on. You know, you're a little bit masked up a little bit. You might have a little bit, uh, a lot of extra mass, but still, you got good peaks, man. Just embrace that. Embrace that mountain. Because when you first start, you know, you go through that uh, aggressive learning curve. You know, you make some mistakes. Sometimes there's some drastic mistakes that are pretty tough to come back from. But at the same time, uh, each thing helps grow your awareness and your wisdom along the way, right? So uh, I'm gonna start with number one, the one thing that I wish I knew, which most people do know now because there's so much free information out there on the internet. One thing I wish I did know when I first started training was that you must maintain a flat back or at least semi-arched back when you're doing bent over rows or squats or overhead presses. And this is something that I did not know when I first started and I ended up herniating a disc. So I went through years of intense training of what is the proper lower back form in order to maintain a healthy lower back because the minute I deviated from what was proper form, I would get excruciating pain or I wouldn't be able to train or all sorts of weird stuff would happen. So the bottom line is that I learned, I became like an expert, like a master in the lower back to find out exactly what the lower back needs to do in order to make sure that I can lift a weight without uh, breaking in pieces. So that's the one thing that I wish I knew. Make sure that you also know increasing your coordination and lower back contraction is not necessarily a bad thing either. Uh, one thing that you can use is a Swiss ball. So say you lay on one of those balls and you lift one leg at a time, that's a great way to actually get more mind muscle connection with those lower back muscles. So that way you are maintaining a lower back arch while you are flexing the hamstrings. <laughs> The guy looks suspicious. I don't trust him. His lats are small. Never trust somebody with small lats. That's all I can say. Just don't trust him. Your mom, she has small lats. Don't trust her. Your dad, don't trust him. Your dog, your cat, don't trust him. If they have small lats, don't trust him. Mountain. So the second thing I wish I knew when I first started training was that different people move differently. So depending on your dimensions, depending on how you're built, will depend on whether, say, deadlifting from the floor is right for you or not. Because for some people, it will be exponentially hard in order for them to keep that lower back from rounding during the deadlift from the floor. So in that way, it may not be the best lift for them or even an efficient lift in any way, shape or form. And they'd be better off with a rack pull or a Romanian deadlift in some way. So I did not know this when I was training when I was 19 or 20 years old. You know, I would do the powerlifting deadlifts thinking, okay, that's, that's what you have to do. You have to do that. And then of course, that's how I ended up herniating a disc in my back because I was doing the double hip whammy. I was doing the improper form along with a movement that wasn't right for my body. I did get into deadlifts later on in my career and I ended up doing quite a bit of weight with deadlifts and I ended up, you know, finding a way to do it. But every time I did do deadlifts, I always felt like I was in a car accident the next day. Like there was more ligament and joint damage than was necessary and it would impede my leg workouts. So that's why I eventually dropped the powerlifting deadlift. It was just not a good way to use my functionality of my body. Now that could be different for you. So don't, don't say that you have to, you know, follow my advice here. But the one thing you do have to follow is finding movements that are in alignment with the way that your body moves that create the least amount of joint pain and the most amount of muscle gain. Hey, that's a good one. No joint pain, but muscle gain. Hey, I like that. Avoid joint pain, get muscle gain. That'd be like a good slogan for a glucosamine bottle or some sort of vitamin bottle. Avoid joint pain, get muscle gain, extra muscle gain, no joint pain. Okay, if you guys use that, you owe me money though. You owe me money, 100%. It's Christmas too. So that's another reason why you owe me money. Super spiritual moment. Mountains are the biceps and the arms of God. What's number three? Hey, what's number three? What do I wish? Okay, number three. Okay, so the third thing that I wish that I knew when I first started training was that letting your blood sugar drop throughout the day will cause your workout to be kind of crappy later on. So what I used to do in the beginning stages, I never really paid attention to my diet when I was 15, 16 years old or when I was 18, 19. It took me till I was about 21, 22 till I started to really pay attention to my diet once I started competing. And what I did notice is that my pumps all of a sudden became better. When I go to the gym, I felt stronger, I had more endurance and uh, the pumps that I was getting in my muscles and my mind muscle connection was even better. So it was almost like some sort of miracle that food could do this. Now I had always heard that eat lots 
and it, that's how you become a bodybuilder that's how you gain muscle is that if you eat enough but the big thing i really learned is that when you let your blood sugar drop so say you skip a meal and you don't eat for five or six hours and you get the shakes and stuff and and you're basically uh letting that blood sugar get down too low what happens is that your body starts to rob some of the glycogen from your muscle tissue so then later on when you go to train that muscle sometimes the glycogen just isn't there or the creatine just isn't there in order for you to have an effective workout they're flying off right now. They must have ate well earlier. Lots of grass and weeds and stuff. Another duck shit because there's a lot of it on the ground here. You don't have to eat that though. You don't have to eat that. So yeah, I underestimated at the early stages of my training how effective eating regularly was. Eating protein and carbs regularly or protein and fats in some cases, depending on you and depending on what you find works best for your energy source or your fuel source. But when I ate regularly and made sure that blood sugar stayed more stable throughout the day, I found that my workouts were, were better. I was stronger and more often than not, I was going up in reps instead of down. So uh, one particular workout I remember, I was bench pressing and I gained like four reps on the bench with the same weight that I was only getting six reps with just from making sure that I ate enough during the day. Cause I was like one of those guys that I just didn't really like eating that much. I just wasn't into eating. Uh, I loved eating junk food, but eating protein and carbs and eating the bodybuilding meals, I was really lazy with that in the beginning stages of my training. So that's one thing I wish I knew right away because I underestimated greatly in the first four or five years of my training, what diet could really do once you start paying attention to it. Now, the fourth thing I wish I knew, and th this is a really important one. This is like one of the biggest ones. I mean, this is, this was life changing for me once I realized this, is that frequent training for some people can be way more effective than doing the bro split or doing the four or five day split where they're training a body part once a week or once every five days. Instead, they're training the whole body three times a week. Say they're doing a two day split and I sell the two day splits on my website. But what I found was that when I was doing a three day split and then I moved to the two day split, my gains started to go through the roof just because I found that my coordination was better. My pumps were better. My mind muscle connection was better and I was getting uh, more effective workouts in that range of the first five or six sets of power and strength and hypertrophy. So I wasn't trying to change weight training into an endurance sport, such as doing 20 or 30 sets for a body part. And basically it's almost like you have just no energy after the you know, first five or six sets to failure. There's really nothing left. So it's really uh, a waste of energy. And if anything, sometimes it puts you into the overtraining mode. If you do too much volume and you're just basically stimulating the muscle and then you're going further and overstimulating because if you overstimulate, all you do is burn out. So each person will have a different threshold for this. But what I did find was that a higher frequency workout was way more effective for me than the lower frequency workouts. And I think that I could have maybe sped up my progress quite a bit if I would have learned this earlier. Now, the next thing I wish that I knew in the beginning stages of my training that I think is extremely important is that mixing up the rep ranges will give you a much more effective way to gain strength and muscle at the same time. There's like a synergistic effect where the high reps help you recover from the low rep days. So for years I trained in the same rep range. I would just do sets of 10 all the time or sets of eight and always measure, am I going up in weight to do those sets of 10 or not? But I wasn't necessarily changing the rep ranges with every single exercise. Like with bench press, I was married to the 10 rep range for the first three years of my training. Or with squats, I was married to the 10 rep range for the first you know, three or four years of my training as well. So it was only when I started to really mix those rep ranges up along with the higher frequency, I started to notice much more mass gains. And those gains helped me gain more strength. So ironically, you know, through doing some of the endurance rep ranges, I started to gain a little bit more strength because my coordination would go up and my recovery would go up because of those high rep days. They would really assist with the recovery and the recuperation and at the same time give my joints a break from taking the overwhelming beating from the heavy weight. Now the next thing that I wish I knew when I first started training was that the big three lifts aren't necessarily the best three lifts for each person. Some people might benefit from them more than others but they are not necessarily required in order for you to gain muscle and gain strength. So they can be a good a uh, pillar for some people. They could be a good place to start, a good template, but they are not necessarily the best way to gain muscle size and strength. So for instance, with squats, I noticed that I got quite a bit of leg size, but at the same time, when I started to do one-legged movements, like one-legged uh, squats on a Smith machine and one-legged free weight squats, I started to notice that I got different development and better development in the legs than just from squats alone. So 
as you mess around with movements and you deviate from the big three lifts, such as deadlift, bench press, and squat, you will notice that there may be better ways for you to stimulate overall growth in your system. And it's not always necessarily from those three lifts. One classic example of this could be is that some people will do bench press for chest size, but they notice that dumbbells give them much more chest size, or maybe dips give them much more chest size, or maybe doing uh, movements on the Smith machine and they get more chest size from that. So don't be afraid to deviate from lifts that aren't necessarily giving you dividends. If, if you want to experiment with other exercises, that's okay. You are not obligated or required to just do deadlift squats and bench for muscle gains. Now, that said, I still believe that they are uh, a good foundation to start with and I do think that they will be the most effective list for some people but just find out which person you are and don't get so married to those lifts that you don't try other lifts because sometimes through using other movements such as the one-legged type movements that I talked about with your squat training you can get way more gains and way more results from your squats because there's again that synergy that happens between the different exercises one works as a stretching exercise one works more as a pumping exercise and through working them together you can and actually get much more results. So the one thing I wish I knew, or another one thing that I wish I knew, when I first started training, which would have saved me a lot of time, it would have saved me a lot of effort and a lot of pain and suffering, is that massage therapy is a great way to make sure that your muscles are functioning properly and a great way to avoid injuries because it helps increase circulation and also helps undo some of those trigger points. So say sometimes you strain in the gym or uh, you, you tweak something kind of funny or maybe your calcium magnesium is off and then you get a muscle knot for some reason or you're out in the cold like this and you get a chill. Sometimes your muscles can knot up and when they do this, then they don't function properly to protect the joint and then may cause referral patterns of pain that may mimic extreme injuries. So for instance, one time I got this major trigger point in my upper back and then it radiated down to my lower back and then down the side of my leg where I got this tearing feeling down my uh, vastus lateralis along with the IT band. Now, of course, the typical physiotherapist that you go to, they would think, oh, you just got iliotibial band syndrome. I went to a massage therapist. I went to a physiotherapist. It just got worse, right? And this one massage therapist who was really open-minded, she said, hey, listen, I've been working on your IT band. It's not your IT band. I need to send you to my instructor. So I went to see her instructor and then he found a bunch of trigger points on my neck, my upper back and my lower back that were radiating like satellite points, like almost like Wi-Fi, down and causing this referral pattern of pain that was experienced like a tearing feeling in my vastus lateralis. So it wasn't that my lateralis in my leg or my outer quad was actually tearing. Nothing was happening there. There was no tearing going on. It was just that there was a referral pattern of pain going on from those other muscle knots. So again, there was six months of pain that I could have avoided just from knowing about massage therapy and how effective it was and that when you get the right trigger point and you get the right breaker switch in that muscle, it can alleviate all sorts of problems, right? So I really underestimated how much compensation could go on in the body from one muscle group to the next and how it can totally uh, mimic a major injury, right? So some people feel like they're going to have a, a pec tear or a bicep tear or something like that. Well, sometimes it's just nothing more than a tight neck or a tight upper back or maybe the shoulder blades aren't moving properly. So when you go to massage therapy, this can help alleviate a lot of these problems. So that's definitely something I think would have saved me a lot of time and I would have got a lot more gains a lot faster if I would have been regularly getting massage therapy from a good massage therapist because, of course, like any profession, there are some that are better than others. Okay, this is the last thing. This is the last thing that I wish I knew. And, and this is kind of a, maybe more a personal one than anything. I wish I knew in the beginning stages of my training how much many of the so-called experts don't know. Because you always have this assumption when you're a kid or when you're a teenager or a young man, you assume that the establishment, such as doctors and, and things, that they know stuff. That they know stuff that somehow is more important than what you know to be true in your own body right? So I think I would have avoided a lot of injuries in this. And if I would have trusted myself when I went to the chiropractor, I wouldn't have ever got a bicep injury. So the bottom line is that you got to learn to trust yourself as you go along, trust what you're experiencing in your body and learn to hone this awareness, expand this awareness, but then trust yourself as well, right? So when you're bringing in an expert's knowledge into your life, you also trust your own experience as well at the same time as you're trying to integrate this. So you're not ignoring some pain or some sort of thing that feels weird to you as you're trying to integrate this person's advice, right? And I think this is a big problem on the internet because a lot of people try to integrate advice from all these different experts and then they end up injuring themselves because they're assuming that the way this person's saying things is automatically applicable to them and it's not always the case so yeah so trust yourself you're a mountain and uh mountains don't take shit from nobody man shit rolls downhill from a mountain it doesn't go up mountain so thanks a lot for watching and if you need to get hold of me just go to naturalgrandbodybuilding.com and uh thanks a lot to the patreon supporters 
Uh, Andrew Rowe, uh, hey, I noticed you just became a bigger deal on here, eh, Andrew? Pretty good. Pretty good, eh? Not only are you a part-time comedian, but now you're the Patreon guy that gets listed up here. That's a big deal. It's a big deal to me anyway. Maybe not a big deal to you, but a big deal to me. So thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks a lot to my friends in Nova Scotia there, Blair and Jen, thank you. Thanks to Garrison Bai. Thank to uh, Philip Copedge. Thank you to a few other people, and I'm gonna be giving shout outs and stuff. So don't worry if I skipped you this time. Don't worry, I'll get around to you. So thanks for watching and take care for now.